Hey y'all, welcome back to the saloon. Hey, before we go any further with the story, I'd like to ask you to hit the notification bell if you haven't already, and please subscribe to this channel for more content. Got some uh, new stuff coming out pretty soon. Got a new music video on the way for a new song and uh, really helps out. So if uh, you like this stuff or I don't know, maybe you just got a friend that just doesn't know about the channel, uh, let them know. Also, folks, I got my new album out, Straight Out of Done. Came out on May 30th, and uh, everybody who gets it really loves it. So here's a link to get that if you want to get a copy. It's on uh, CD format. Well, you know hats. You probably don't ever see me wear a hat because I really don't wear hats too much. I wear a baseball cap sometimes, you know, out in the yard working or just, you know, mulling around, but uh, hats used to be a big thing. You know, everybody used to wear hats, and here's a little known fact for you. Everyone wore hats up until the time of John F. Kennedy's presidency. And why was that? Because John F. Kennedy was the first president who didn't wear a hat, so people just stopped wearing hats. It became a thing of the past. But what do hats have in common with a meat delivery service in Taj Mahal. Well, I'll tell you. You know, back in 2003, when I was trying to find my way to balancing being a professional musician with the last of my searches for a regular day job, I had gotten with this temporary agency that was a one of these uh, frozen meat things where they deliver meat door to door. And I, I was... Tried it out for about two days, didn't even get paid because you had to train first and ride with somebody door to door and knocking on doors, just doing dry calls to, to folks and soliciting them for meat. <laughs> so uh, you didn't get paid. You basically worked off commission and you just had to watch your, your guy that you were with do this. Well, the first day that I did it, I mean, it was like a 14, 12 hour day, something like that. I can't remember. It seemed like 14 hours, seemed like 16 hours because it was absolutely miserable. And on the way home from delivering this meat, I get a call uh, from a guy named, uh, I can't remember his name. I think his name was Richard. Uh, oh, it doesn't matter. But he used to uh, be the owner of the Cotillion Ballroom in Wichita, Kansas, where I lived at the time. And, you know, it's weird how when you can be down in the dumps and think, oh man, it, it just can't get much worse. Something always brings you out of it, or that's the way it's been in my experience. I got a call from Richard on the way home in the, this guy's pickup truck delivering meat, who had the personality of a rock. And, uh, <laughs> He goes, Matt, guess what? Listen, Taj Mahal is coming to town. Your music is so much like his in the same vein. What do you think about opening up for him? You know, I was like, goodness gracious, somebody's looking out for me here. Uh, this changed my whole day. So, of course, I said, yes, I will be glad to open up for Taj Mahal. Well, that was... The concert was not going to be for like another three months. It was like three months away. Okay. So in the meantime, I'm still looking for, you know, little jobs and stuff and, and uh, went and filled out an application at this hat store called Hat Man Jacks. It's still in uh, Wichita, Kansas. I think it's owned by a guy named, I think his last name is Kellogg, Jack Kellogg. And, um, that was one of the places that I put in and, you know, I went to try to get a, you know, interview. And, um, I had put down as a reference, Barry Harris pop, who, you know, from other episodes of shallow saloon stories, he was my best friend out there. And, uh, he said, I could put him down. He said, sure. So I put me down for a reference. Somebody calls you, I'll call. <laughs> but anyway, 
So I missed the call. Apparently, uh, Hatman Jax had called my house looking for me and couldn't find me. This was before the time of cell phones really being, you know, everybody's got one in their pocket. I think this would have been around 2002, 2003, I want to say, probably the later. But um, anyhow, Barry calls up and he says, hey, uh, that guy's looking for you. What guy? <laughs> that was Barry. The hat man, the hat man looking for you. You need to go down here. He's going to give you a drive. I said, okay, sounds good. So, you know, he wanted to, to give me an interview was what it was when I called down. So me being me, I, I, I had a couple hats to my name, felt hats uh, that were given to me. One was given to me by Barry, which is the one that I ended up wearing down to my interview. I put a nice shirt on, but I made sure to wear a hat. And uh, I guess Jack liked me enough that he decided to hire me. So I started working at the hat store, which was the last uh, job I had before I became a musician full time. I've never had another job since, but it was one of the most interesting and fun jobs that I've had because there, number one, aren't many hat stores around anymore. And number two, the practice of, you know, washing hats, blocking hats, learning to shape hats, learning everything there is about hats. Like for instance, this hat's a straw hat. You can't get it wet. If you do, it'll come undone. And by the way, I'm wearing a, uh, I think it's a Dobbs uh, stingy brim pork pie hat. Um, wearing this hat because another reason I found working in the hat store that people didn't like hats, they come and go, I, I like hats, but none of them look good on me. And you would find out nine times out of 10 that they were buying a hat that wasn't working with their face shape. So a guy like me, it's got more of a long kind of slender face, a big brimmed, you know, um, fedora is not going to look right. Just the opposite. A guy that's got a big square face, if he wears a little hat like this, it's going to make his hat, his face look even bigger and make it look like he's got this little tiny hat on. So anyhow, um, back to the story. Uh, I learned how to block hats, shape hats, clean hats, Anything you could do, sew a hat band back into a hat. Whatever it was, that's what I did at the hat store, um, besides doing a little retail and selling hats on the floor. So, uh, you know, about three months, I've been working at the hat shop, probably, you know, a couple months or so. And, um, you know, it comes around to the time to open up for Taj Mahal. Now, I became a big fan of Taj Mahal when I was in my early teens because you know, a, a lot of the stuff that he was doing was, you know, basically the country blues that I was listening to people like Sunhouse and Booker White, you know, all these cats doing, um, and, and I just loved his take on it. Um, and I thought he was great. So I was really excited to open up for Taj Mahal. I had seen him a couple of years before with the Music Maker uh, Relief Foundation when they did the Winston Blues uh, revival. It was uh, sponsored by Winston Cigarettes. And uh, anyway, I saw him with Neil Patman, who was a fantastic Piedmont blues man who played harmonica. He only had one arm. Um, but when I saw him uh, with Taj Mahal at the Winston blues revival, Taj was playing a big stand up bass, puffing a huge cigar, and you know, just looking as cool as possible you possibly could. And uh, Neil Patman was sitting there with a, a suit on, you know, and, and just killing the, the harmonica. And that was it. Stand up bass and harmonica. That was the set. Along with uh, Neil Patman's wife, who did a butt dance while they were playing around the stage with a big red boa and a red uh, dress on, you know, and it's something out of like cross, the end of the movie Crossroads. If you've ever seen that movie, it wasn't far from that, except, you know, Ralph Macchio wasn't doing karate moves on the guitar and Steve Vai wasn't the devil there. So <laughs> Taj Mahal and Neil Patman played that part really well. I mean, that was, uh, it was, it was like, you felt the devil's music right there. Like you were in a barrel house back in the South in like 1930 something, you know? And I always say the devil's music because that's what they used to call blues um, in the deep South back in the early thirties. A lot of, you know, folks were, thought, you know, if you played blues, that that was the devil's music. You know, they wanted you to play religious, you know, gospel music. So anyway, back to the story. So it comes time to do the, the gig. We're all excited. Um, I had uh, Jesse Major uh, playing stand-up bass with me, who played with me a lot out in Kansas, and Daryl Greenlee on the harmonica. 
Well, it just so happened that I saw the guy that owned the cotillion. He said, hey, man, he said, would you like to come backstage where Taj is and everything? We were like, yeah, sure, you know, fantastic. So I go back there and Taj is sitting on a couch and uh, went up to him. And I said, hey, my name's Matt Walsh. You know, I'm the guy that's open it for you and everything. And I can't remember what he said. He was a very funny person. He had a very, very dry sense of humor that it would catch you really off guard. I can't remember what he said, but I proceeded to sit down on the couch with him and talk for, God, good 45 minutes, it seemed like. He was very kind and welcoming and, and answered all my goofy questions. Like, for example, I said, Taj, you know, I said, you know, on these old recordings, I've been trying to get my national steel guitar to have that more of that banjo kind of tone to it. And I said, how do you, how do you get that? Is it just the age of the, the national duolian that you have? And, and that national for you people that don't, play music, a national steel guitar was a guitar that was uh, popularized by the Dauphier brothers. Um, it was a metal body guitar that acted like, um, almost like an ampli pre-amplified guitar. It didn't have amplification, it wasn't electric, but there was a speaker cone that they call a pipe hand in the body of the guitar that acted almost like a speaker does in your radio. So back then, you know, you're playing in juke joints and stuff and people couldn't hear an acoustic guitar with these, these uh, national steel resonators. They resonated and were so loud that you could be heard over a noisy juke joint, that kind of thing. So I asked him, you know, how do you get that sound? And he said, it's simple. You just put an unwound G string on for your G string. You don't use a wound string, which gives you more of that banjo-y kind of sound. I had forgotten about this somewhere down the road and ironically enough, did not remember this till about two years ago when I started doing some country blues gigs and revisiting some of the stuff that I was doing in my early 20s uh, for a limited kind of time and, and was doing these acoustic gigs. And that came back to me that, hey, you need to put an unwound G string. So just a tip for guitar players, if you are if you are a guitar player, try it out because it will change the acoustic guitar for you. The G string, if you know in your guitar player, goes dead like it's like 20 minutes after you put it on, right? So anyway, but I, I told Taj about, uh, you know, uh, seeing him with Neil Patman. And, and I think that was one of the first things that I, I rolled off to him that kind of, like letting him know that hey man I'm I'm legit I'm no one of, I'm not just a guy that's coming back here just to be starstruck or whatever I really wanted to, to talk to him because I had been listening to him for years and years and so oddly enough our conversation changed from music to hats and the picture that you see um, he I, I might not I may have showed it earlier I, it's definitely the picture that you'll see on the, the cover of this video. He had a, what is called a Guatemalan palm hat on. And it's, believe it or not, one of the only straw hats that you can get wet. You actually shape the hat by getting it wet. In fact, we would have cowboys that would come in off the plains uh, out in Kansas that would come to Jack. All the cowboys came to Jack because he knew how to shape their hats. In fact, Jack at the hat store made all the hats for the show Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. And not only that, uh, he also made hats for B.B. King and Charlie Daniels actually came by the store a couple times. I was not there, but I was there when Pavarotti came by and closed down the whole store, had his chauffeur come in and put a stool in the middle of the hat, hat store while he bought, you know, selected hats to be brought to him to try on. And I think he walked out with like 15 or 16 hats that day. He was playing a concert in town. But anyway, um, you know... The cowboys would come in back to the Guatemalan palm. They would come in because these guys would actually, uh, when they come with their old Guatemalan palms that they had bought, these things would be like, I mean, they would look like you just took them through a mud pie or something because they would be out there working and wrangling and doing stuff like that in these hats in the summertime, but they would get kind of old and nasty looking because the cowboy, one of them told me, he said, what we do is we actually take them off when they get hot and dip them in the, the, the horse trough and then put them back on so it'll keep our head cool. So anyway, I knew about the Guatemalan palm. Let me get a drink here real quick. I knew about the Guatemalan palm and um, I started talking to Tosh about it. I said, you know, that's the only hat that you can get wet. He said, oh, you know about Guatemalan palm? I said, yeah, man. I said, you know, I, little, I know a little something about hats. You know, I said, my day gig is, is working at a hat store. 
So anyway, it became time for me to go on stage and uh, he told me good luck and hey, thanks for, thanks for, uh, enjoyed talking to you, whatever. And we said our goodbyes and, uh, <laughs> I went on stage and did did a set, had a great time. Ended up sitting on the side of the stage and watching Taj come out and play. I think he was playing with what he called the Phantom Blues Band at that time. Had Mike, Fe I can't remember who was on. Seems like some I can't remember. It had some 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 pretty famous people in the band. But anyway, I just remember at one point I think he he uh, saw me on the side of the stage and he started nodding his head like this at me, you know. <laughs> so it was really cool. So the next day I go back to reality working at the hat store and, um, you know, after lunchtime, this, uh, guy comes, see this hat coming in, looks like a Guatemalan palm and lo and behold, guess who it is? Taj Mahal. <laughs> and I, I came out and said, Hey, remember me? He said, Hey, he said, you really do know something about hats. I said, I said yeah, this is where I work. And uh, anyway, he came in and uh, talked to, to Jack and everything and ended up buying a couple of uh, Borsellino straw hats, which are Italian straw hats, very, very nice straw hats, and um, said said goodbyes. But uh, that would end up being one of the first times I opened up for Taj Mahal. There was another time a little bit later on. So uh, you just, you never know. Well, folks, if you enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe, tell a friend, and I hope to see you back next week at the saloon. Y'all take care, all right? Bye-bye.